All right, we are now 40 weeks into the book of Revelation. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this food that we are about ready to receive. May we be filled, nourished, and strengthened by your food. And Father, give us this day our daily bread, our daily portion of Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Good to see y'all. All right, now, last time we went through the first three bowl judgments, and we've seen how these judgments have been progressive so far. We saw how Christ opened the seals and started these judgments. And one, once you get to the seventh seal, it begins the, the trumpet judgments. And once you get to the seventh trumpet, we have the seven bowls. And the trumpet judgments are more severe than the seals and the bowl judgment. Or the, the trumpet judgments are more severe than the seals and the bowl judgments are more severe than the trumpets. Right? They're different. And in these bowl judgments, the wrath of God is complete. Right. In our last study, we discussed the first three bowl judgments, and we talked about how some people believe that they were the same, but they're not. Um, the first one destroyed a third of things in the trumpets, but the bowl judgments, they destroy everything, right? It's a complete judgment. It, it's, the, it's the completion of God's wrath. So there are two different sets of judgments being poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. So we're just going to continue in verse 8 with the uh, fourth angel. Revelation 16, 8 and 9, And the fourth angel poured out his vial on, upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great hell, and blasphemed the name of God, which is, hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Now the first angel poured out his bowl on the earth, the second poured it out on the sea, the third angel poured it out on the rivers and the springs of water, now this angel pours it out on the sun. These judgments are being poured out on God's creation, and God's creation in return is doing the judgment. So the vehicle God is using to pour out his judgment is through his own creation. It's devastating. Now, this angel is pouring out his bowl on the sun, and this kind of goes along with the, the fourth trumpet, right? Uh, Revelation 8:12. And a fourth of the angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, third part of the stars. So the judgment has to do with, <coughs> excuse me, I'm telling you, these allergies are awful. But these judgments have to do with the sun. It's this, and we know the sun is the light giving source, right? And power was given to him to scorch men with fire. So it would appear by pouring out this bowl upon the sun, it would appear that the sun's going to get hotter, right? I've been told if, if the earth was just a few degrees closer to the sun, that it would be un uninhabitable because it would be too hot. And if it was a few degrees further, then we couldn't live here because it would be too cold. So with this being the case, the earth sets perfect, perfectly in place in order for life to be sustained on earth. If God were to turn up the heat of the sun, it would make the earth uninhabitable. And honestly, this is kind of what's being implied here. It's not so hot that everybody's just going to die, but it's hot enough that our stratosphere, our ozone layer, these things that protect us from the heat and shield us from ultraviolet rays, they're not going to be able to protect anymore. Right? This, to me, is the implication here. And this is horrible. Can you possibly imagine all of these judgments, one right after another? The boils, the blood, the, the water, there's no drinking water. It, it's just going to be devastating. And now the sun, you're, now you're being scorched by the sun. <sighs> this is the judgment of God on that world that is rejecting him. Right, Luke 21, and verse 25. We kind of get the same thing. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and, the, and in the stars and upon the earth. Distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So, signs in the sun, it's all through the Old Testament. I'm not going to read these, but there's five prophecies about um, the signs in the sun in the Old Testament. About this judgment. It is Deuteronomy chapter 32. You get it in 22 and 24. 
Isaiah 24 and verse 6, Isaiah 42 and 25, and Malachi 4, 1. So it's going to be it's going to be extremely devastating at this time. And in verse 8, you get the fourth bowl being poured out. And then in verse 9, you get the people's reaction to what's going on. Right? This has been their reaction all through Revelation. Right? So let's go back to 16. And men were scorched with great hell and blasting the name of God, which has power over these plagues, and they repented not. To give him glory. Right, men are being judged here, and there is no room for repentance. Repentance. And we talked about the Amalekites. God gave them four hundred years, and they never repented. It's the same situation here. They blasphemed the name of God because of what was going on. And sometimes we think if people get to their lowest point and they have nothing left, that they would cry out to God and repent. But that's not the case here. This is not happening. They receive these judgments and they curse God. They blaspheme his name. They refuse to give him glory. And guys, God will not force repentance. He gets glory in our free will. And he gets glory when we don't choose him. Either way, he'll receive that glory. But it's a choice that one has to make. You either choose to love him or you choose not to love him. You choose to repent or you choose not to repent. These people curse God and they refuse to accept him. God is so long-suffering, I believe that he's still trying to get these people to wake up. He's still trying to get them to repent at this time. And I believe that through these judgments, he wants them to repent. God wants men to repent, but they're, they, they, they don't. Right? The Bible tells us he wants all to come un, unto repentance, but not all men do. And what's... What I really want us to get tonight is about this particular plague of, of the heat and everything. Some may ask what type of God would put someone in hellfire for eternity. Right. Why not just a thousand years? Why not just two thousand years? Right. I want us to get this. Right. And then after a thousand years or two thousand years, when, when we're all cleansed by the fire, they can get out of hell and go to heaven. Right? Does that sound familiar? Sounds pretty much like purgatory. But the problem with purgatory, this is the problem. One, the Bible says hell is forever and punishment is forever. Okay? Two, what's going on here in these scriptures we're just now reading? People are being scorched. They're be, they're already they they're going through the blood. They have no water to drink. They can't go take showers. They got boils and itches all over them. And they're being scorched here in this verse. They're already being burned here. And they still curse God. Do you really think when they're in hell burning that they're going to turn to God? No. They're burning here and they curse him. And you know what? They'll burn in hell and curse him too. There, <clears throat> there is no repentance. If they can't give the, give the God of creation glory right now on this earth, they never will. And oh, they will, they bow down when the time comes and confess him Lord, but they will still be burning and cursing him. There has to be eternal, eternal punishment because, because men will not repent. No matter how hot it gets, no matter how much they hurt, no matter how much they starve or have no water, they do not repent. That's why there's an eternal hell. These people are being inflicted by all, everything that's going on and they curse the God of creation. It's, 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 it's amazing. All right, let's jump to the fifth bowl, down in verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. See, we see, still see the same thing. They don't repent. That's why there's an eternal hell. 
So where is this where's this bowl poured out though? <clears throat> On the throne of the beast. And this is specifically targeted to the throne of the beast, which is Babylon. Right? The Bible says that Babylon will be destroyed to the point that no one will ever be able to inhabit it, and it has not yet been destroyed. Babylon has been conquered. It was con it was conquered in Daniel chapter 5, but Babylon was never destroyed. So when the Bible talks of Babylon, it, it, and it's not only in reference to the actual place either, but it's also in reference to idolatry, right? This end-time religious system that this Antichrist and false prophet bring with them. They create this. In John's day, Rome was considered Babylon because it was the center of idolatry. And I do believe that the works of the Antichrist and his central place of power will ultimately be in the city of Babylon, which is in modern-day Iraq. It may not start there, but it will end there. And there are many, or there are three different opinions about where Babylon is. Is it? It's either in the city of Babylon, New York City, or Rome. And I'm not going to get into all that. I personally believe it's going to be the actual city in Iraq, right? If you want to look at the others, that's fine. But this bowl was poured out on the on the throne of the beast. So wherever this beast sets up his throne, and this is going to be where it's going to happen. And notice that the judgment's going to be extended to his kingdom as well in verse 10. Right? And his kingdom was full or became full of darkness. So that kind of goes back to the fourth trumpet in Revelation 8:12. Right? And the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten, third part of the moon and third part of the stars, so they were darkened. It goes back to the fifth trumpet. In uh, 9 and verse 2, <clears throat> he opened the bottomless pit and there rose smoke out of the pit and smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened. Alright, we also get it. The Exodus background for this plague is the ninth plague. Right, in the ninth plague you had a specific darkness that could be felt. Right, this wasn't just darkness. This was darkness that you could feel. And as we read in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 16, we see that they gnawed their tongues because of pain so these people still these people still find it in their hearts to blaspheme god and not repent they're gnawing their tongues and they're still cursing god this is specifically on the throne of the beast and his kingdom and just like the exodus judgment the children of god in the tribulation period will also have light in their dwelling places there's not going to be any darkness god always looks after his people um, there's a few Old Testament backgrounds for this as well. Let's jump over to Isaiah 60 and verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Right, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Here we're going to go to Joel chapter 2. Verse 1, blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord has come for it's nigh at hand. And verse 2, a day of darkness and gloomliness, right? A day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and strong, there has never been the light, neither shall be any after it, even to the years of many generations. Jump down to uh, verse 31 in Joel 2. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So darkness. They're going to gnaw their tongues because of this pain. This is a very intense agony going on here. And we also get it if Jesus even talks about this. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 30. And cast you the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's almost like a preview of hell, if you ask me. But, again, the reaction in verse 11. And blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Alright, so because of their pains and their sores... So it appears that these bowls are coming quickly enough for them to overlap, right? The first bowl was the sores, 
Now the fifth bowl is the pain of darkness, and they have both that pain and the sores. So they still have sores when this darkness comes. So they're overlapping here, right? These, these plagues are coming quick. And again, they don't repent of their deeds. The fourth bowl, they did not repent. The fifth bowl, they did not repent. And as we're going to see later on, they still refuse to repent. We can see from the book of Revelation that the judgment of God does not make men repent, but the goodness of God is what makes them repent. But they're not repenting. Sixth bowl. The sixth bowl um, is going back to the great river Euphrates and the waters. Unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. Uh, they're the spirits of the devil working miracles. They go, they go unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them into battle of the great day of Almighty. So it's like these, these spiritual frogs or spirit frog demons, because that's what it said. They're spirits of devils. They're like telling these kings, hey, you need to go to Armageddon. You need to go to Mount Megiddo, right? It's telling them to gather them to Mount Megiddo, which is where we're going to end up, is the Battle of Armageddon. So, behold, in verse 15, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed are they that watch and keep his garments, at least they walk naked and see his shame. And he gathered them into the place called, in the Hebrew, Har Megiddon. Right? So, the sixth bowl judgment, it goes back to the sixth trumpet judgment. Right, because it's talking about the sixth angel which had the trumpet loose the four angels which are bound at the great river Euphrates. So we see the same thing going on. Now these two judgments relate because we see Euphrates. And in this trumpet judgment they kill a third of man and there is no discussion about anyone dying in the sixth bowl. Right, the, the trumpet kills a third of man. The sixth bowl, no one dies. So there's, there are two different judgments. They appear to be related, but they're two different, two different judgments. Okay. And the sixth uh, angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters were dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. <clears throat> All right, so we've seen the river Euphrates. We've read about it. We saw it earlier in Revelation. We see it in Genesis chapter 15, Deuteronomy 1, Joshua 4. The Euphrates River is very significant because it's the location of Babylon. It's right off the Euphrates River. The Euphrates was a divider between those of the east and of the west. And most scholars will tell you that the Euphrates forms the eastern boundaries of the Roman Empire. So this sixth bowl judgment is poured out on this great river Euphrates and its waters dry up. I don't think there's any symbolism going on here. This is actually the river Euphrates drying up. And we have this prophesied a number of times in scriptures. Jeremiah chapter 50 and 35, it deals with the judgment of Babylon, which we're going to get into into the next few chapters. But go ahead and read Jeremiah 50, 35 through 38. God's judgment against Babylon's for their idols, for it's the land of graven images. The words... And they are mad upon their idols is better worded that they were insane for their idols. And this world, I'm telling you guys, is insane for their idols. Money, sex, internet, porn, whatever you value the most, the most people are insane against it, right? You can't get someone that that does porn just a little bit. No, they, they're into it. They're, they're, they're engrossed in it. They're insane for it. You can't get someone that just wants a little money. No, they want all the money. They got five billion, but they want 35 billion. They want 50. Billion. These people, this world is insane for their idols. Our culture is out of control. Now notice the drought upon her waters. They're going to be dried up <clears throat> in Jeremiah. But this is what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12. So this scripture is a, ful a fulfillment of the sixth bowl judgment in Jeremiah. Um, I didn't read that one. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 10. We'll read Zechariah 10 and verse 11. It's, it's another one. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea and all the deeps of the river shall dry up. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt 
shall depart away. So notice why the waters are dried up in, in our scriptures. So the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So you can literally take out the word east and replace it with the rising sun. That's really the best translation of the scripture. So that the way of the kings of the rising sun might be prepared. Right, the rising sun is in the east. And that's the reason they replaced it and, and put the east. But really, it's the rising sun. It's, it's better. It's a better translation. But the water is being dried up so that the people can pass through. And we also see this in relationship to the drying up of the Red Sea so that the children could pass through, right, over dry land. So this idea is nothing new. God's done this before. And this judgment is making way for the kings of the rising sun so that they can come. I jump back to Isaiah chapter 11 of verse 15. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he make his hand over the river, shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. This is exactly what's happening here. You could think of, think of China and Nepal, Japan, anything that is east of the Euphrates coming in judgment. The Euphrates River is the farthest boundary to the north that was given to Abraham as part of that promised land. From the Euphrates to the north and the Nile to the south that was given. The west bank of the Euphrates would be Syria and Iraq. So this territory was under the reign of Solomon. It was given to the children of Israel in the northern boundary and will be dried up in the tribulation. All right. Now it's 1,800 miles long, 30 feet deep on average. All right, so it's 300 to 1,200 feet in width. It's a big river. I mean, this river is huge. <clears throat> now, Kings of the Rising Sun, which has always been the emblem of both Japan and China. Always. Imagine if the technology of Japan were mixed with the manpower of China it would be devastation. It would be an army of destruction, even for the United States. China has already declared, they have already stated this. They've declared that in three months, they could create an army of how many do you think so? Right? What does the Bible say? Exact amount, scriptures, 200 million men. Which is interesting because John sees an army of 200 million that we read about previously in chapter 9. And when they come, the, the earth, a third of the population of the earth is going to be slaughtered along the way. Slaughtering country after country. Could this be China and Japan? It could be. Or it could be something else that John was describing. But I wanted to bring this up. Right? I'm not necessarily saying this is what it is. I'm just throwing it out there. Now, one out of every four people live in China. Just imagine that. One out of every four people live in China. So they could easily, easily muster up an army of this size. <clears throat> you know, China's been aborting females for years because there's so many people. They've been abor doing abortions and they mainly abort the females and they only allow for the males to be born because males can grow up. Males will be able to help their families and support their families. And males can fight in wars. Right? Males can keep the family name going on. So they abort the women. There's massive abortion going on. Okay, back to Revelation 16 and verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, all three of them. So we're seeing these unclean, three unclean spirits. It's, it's something that's impure, right? It's something very demonic. They're, they are like frogs, but they're not frogs. This is symbolic language again. Now we've been seeing the relationship that those judgments have with the Exodus plagues as well. 
the frogs. The only other usage for frogs in scripture is in Exodus when it was dealing with that second plague. And what it said in Exodus after those plagues, um, they gathered all these frogs together in heaps and the land stunk. It stank. So in the second Egyptian plague, God sent a plague of frogs and the frogs were everywhere. We have the same idea here in this trumpet. This judgment is like frogs. Now, in the Jewish, to the Jewish person, frogs are considered very unclean. And these unclean spirit-like frogs have a very negative connotation. They are not friendly frogs, right? They're very unclean spirits. <clears throat> and notice where they're coming from. And I saw three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, right? The beast, and out of the false prophet. So it would appear that these frog-like demons are coming out of the mouth of each one of this holy demonic trinity okay we talked about the dragon the beast the false prophet in chapters 12 and 13 we're going to get into more when we hit babylon in chapter 17 or 18 now the false prophet or the dragon is satan the beast of course is the beast of the sea which is the antichrist and the false prophet the beast of the earth and since the demons are coming out of their mouths of these three it denotes lying and deception really it denotes lying and deceptive words kind of like the sword from christ's mouth that is equal to his word of truth these this denotes that lying and deceitful mouth coming from these three people is it by chance that first john chapter 4 tells us let's look at uh first john chapter 4 <clears throat> first john 4 so it's not by chance. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ comes in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard of it should come, and even now already it is in the world. So, right. <clears throat> so I'm thinking... I don't know if these are going to be like literal frog-like demon spirits. I don't know. But the point is, is that there's going to be deception. There's going to be lying. And we are to test the spirits, right? It all goes hand in hand here in Revelation. There is deception going on today. And there are all sorts of deceiving spirits. We can't believe everything we hear. We need to be Berean Christians studying for ourselves instead of taking what someone else says is truth. But these unclean spirits, like frogs, are satanic. Okay, let's jump over to verse 14. Okay, 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So the spirits are of devils performing signs. We get that from 2 Thessalonians. Right? It's going to have the working of, of working of at the <clears throat> whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, right? Guys, we need to be careful. People have a tendency to flock after signs and wonders. I'm just saying this because it's true. There are many deceiving people in this world and we need to be careful not to flock to them. There are satanic wonders, right? Remember Pharaoh's magicians? They could turn wood into a snake. They took their staffs and turned them into snakes. So there's satanic wonders. But these lying, deceiving signs are meant to bring into judgment those who would not receive the love of the truth. So with all of the anti-Christian things in our nation today, homosexuality, abortion, many other things that the United States have accepted, I believe that we are ready, we are ripe, we are fully ripe, ready to be judged because as a nation, we have lost our love for the truth. Remember we talked about the wine press and the grapes, one was kind of withered and dried up, but the other was fully ripe. I think the United States is fully ripe. I think we're ready for this judgment. And it's coming, guys. God will give us what we want. And if we want judgment, we want to curse him. We want to do 
evil in his sight and do these abominations in his sight and accept for killing of millions of babies and accepting of all this sin in this world in the body of Christ as well. If we want judgment, we're going to get it. All right now, the idea of lying and deceiving spirits, it's, it goes back to the Old Testament as well. Where did the sixth bowl judgment initiate with God? Jesus started opening the seals. The seals gave way for the trumpets, and the trumpets gave way to the bowls, and this judgment is from God. And he has ordained these frog-like demon spirits that perform signs proceeds from the mouths of the unholy trinity. Just like this lying spirit that goes forth and puts lies in the mouths of Ahab's prophets, if you remember. Because God had spoken evil concerning them. So the river Euphrates it dries up, and the way of the kings of the rising suns are prepared. Three unclean spirits, like frogs, come from the unholy trinity. They are performing signs and wonders. And now in the middle of verse 14... They, draw, they, they gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So they're going out to all these kings of the world to gather them into the battle of the great day of the Almighty. Right? The Greek word for gathering, it only shows up one other time in the Gospels. John the Baptist speaking of Christ in Luke 3.17. Whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner but the chaff will be burned with fire unquenchable, right? Now notice the kings of the earth are being gathered together to the battle of that great day of Almighty God. This is exactly what Luke chapter 3 and verse 17 is all about. This is not a localized war. This is the kings of the whole earth, the whole world coming together. Now, there, I believe there's still three prophetic battles that we are still waiting for, since we're talking about war here. There's still, there's still three prophetic battles. Battle, three prophetic battles. Say that ten times in a row. We get the battle of Gog and Magog and her allies against Israel. We get that in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. We have the battle of Armageddon, right, when the Antichrist leads the world system against a returning Jesus. And this is what we're talking about here in these scriptures in Revelation. And then we have that final battle when Satan and his allies are released out of the bottomless pit. Or, I mean, released after the millennial reign, sorry. After the thousand years to make war with God again. And the nations are deceived and they flock to Satan for that final battle. So these, these prophetic battles, I think we're still waiting for. And I believe that these scriptures in chapter 16 that we're reading about, they're speaking about the battle of Armageddon. It's the last war before Jesus Christ comes back. The sixth bowl, the kings are, are the kings are only gathered, and it's not until the seventh bowl that the confrontation and defeat actually occurs. So the sixth bowl is a preparation judgment. It's gathering them. Uh, Zechariah 14.1. Sorry on the video, you can look these up. I'm running out of time here. Um, I'm not going to go to my e-sword and do it. So... Zechariah 14, 1, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. And 2 and 3, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of her people shall be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So this is speaking of the upcoming battle, the one we're reading about now, the battle of Armageddon. Now, as we move into, into, into verse 15, we have a declaration, right? Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he be naked, or lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. So he's going to come suddenly and unexpectedly. Listen closely to what I'm going to say. This is another reason most believe that the church will be here during the same time if we were then christians would see these things going on and and they would go oh okay well this is happening so we can count three and a half years and this is happening we can count seven years right the mark of the beast the dark the darkness people can feel having all these sores the sun the people being burned with fire all of a sudden euphrates drying up 
And then the people who are Christians would be like, oh yeah, he's coming. So the Bible says that he comes as a thief. That's why many do not believe that the church is here at this time. Okay, otherwise Christ wouldn't be coming as a thief. Okay, I just want to throw that out there, right? 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great warrant, the elements shall be melted up with fervent, and blah, blah, blah. I think that's more or less talking about um, the new heaven and the earth. Because we're not going to be, the earth ain't going to be. Where is it? Yeah, the earth also and the works of there will be burned up. Yeah, I don't think we're talking about that. But 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child. They shall not escape. Okay. So we see over and over and over again that the Lord comes in as a thief. And the question is, is are you ready? I hope so. All right. And then we have being clothed. Right. He keeps his garment, at least he walk naked, and they see his shame. So we get 2 Corinthians 5, 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. I don't want anyone to be found naked. Trust me, I don't want to see any naked bodies floating around here, all right? We see enough of those every now and then on cam. Crazy people, I'm telling you. But I want us all to be prepared, right? We all need to be ready and alert. And he gathered them together in a place in the Hebrew called Armageddon. So Har in the Greek is the word mountain. Right? If you break down Armageddon, you get Harmageddon. Har in the Greek is the word mountain. And Megiddo is, or Megad, Megedon, Harmageddon is Megiddo. So Mount Megiddo. Megiddo means rendezvous. Right? So it's like there's an appointment here in, at this place that's going to happen. And the interesting thing is that the verse is that there's really no mountain in Megiddo. Megiddo is a valley. It's the valley of Megiddo. It's located 60 miles north of Jerusalem, and it's called the Jezreel Valley. Right? There's tons of biblical battles that go on in this area. Deborah over Sisera in Judges. You got Gideon over the Midianites in Judges. You got Pharaoh over the King Josiah in 2 Kings. Right? There's biblical battles that have been fought here. So some people believe that the Mount Megiddo is literally Mount Carmel because of its proximity to the Mount to the Valley of Megiddo. And there's really no reference to Mount Megiddo in the Old Testament or in Jewish literature whatsoever. Right? So because of that, a lot of people do not believe it's Megiddo. I talked about this a few lessons back. Uh, I believe it's going to be in the Valley of Megiddo. Right, the valley of Je Jezreel Valley. I really believe that. Zephaniah 3 8. Therefore, wait you upon me, says the Lord, until the day that I will rise to pray. For my determination is to gather the nations. Here we go again. My determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. And this is what exactly the sixth bowl is all about. It's about God gathering the unrepented nations together to this valley of Megiddo where there have been over 200 battles throughout history so that he can pour out again his another battle, his fierce anger upon these nations. Okay, Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 47. This is going to be the strategy that's going to be used in this final battle of Armageddon. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to just give you a synopsis and we'll be done. <clears throat> the king of the south, Egypt and northern African nations, they launch an insurrection against the Antichrist. They rebel and they shoot north to the area or shoot north into the area of Israel. They're hoping to overthrow the Antichrist troops that are that are around Jerusalem. Okay, at the same time, the king of the north is coming down to join the insurrection, right? The king of the north is Russia. They're going to assist the Egyptians in their rebellion against the Antichrist, but the Russians trick them. The Russians trick the king of the south, and they continue all the way down into Egypt, 
and they take all their treasures. Right? And the Antichrist then comes from the East to put down these rebellions, right? He wants to stop them. And, and he goes to Jerusalem and he sets up his tents between the Mediterranean Sea and the temple right there in the Jezreel Valley, possibly Armageddon like we talked about. And the Antichrist heads down to dissolve that rebellion, but then he, hear, he hears of reports of a very large army that's coming from the east and he gets troubled by this. We read all this in Daniel 11. Armies of the east, probably China and Japan, and the armies of the north, Russia armies, Russia and the armies of the South Egypt. So the Antichrist in Israel is now trying to hang on to Israel. And these are all converging on Israel. All of them. Armies of the North. We got Russia. Armies of the East. China, Japan. Egypt. Armies of the South. They're all converging on Israel. And honestly, I'd be troubled too if I, if I were uh, had that many people coming after me. <laughs> coming after me um, but anyways God is gathering all of these nations into this valley for war so we'll stop here continue next week or next study Heavenly Father we thank you for your time that we can come together I ask that you bless us that you open our eyes to your word that you give us a hunger and a thirst and a desire for your word Father and most of all those that, that don't know you as their Lord and Savior Father that they would accept you and they would believe in you and they would accept that free gift of salvation right now so they don't have to go through any of this Heavenly Father and ultimately be in outer darkness forever. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, your long suffering. We thank you for Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. We thank you for him, Heavenly Father. We ask that you continue to bring us back safely, that you keep protecting us from any sicknesses and diseases in this earth, Father. And that ultimately, Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Anything spoken in the flesh, let it die. But that which is spoken in truth and love and spirit, let it remain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, keep the faith. God bless.